This is Teachers Talk Radio, and you are listening live. Hello and welcome to the Monday Twilight Show with me, Hannah Wilson. Tonight I'm going to be delving through the comment sections on news articles about teachers and why the public have such a different perception of teaching to what it really is. So join in, you can call in or message if you'd like. This is Teachers Talk Radio and you are listening live. Tune in live at ttradio.org or to join in the conversation, download the Podbean app and search Teachers Talk Radio. Follow the hashtag TT Radio. Tune in, talk it out with Teachers Talk Radio. This show is brought to you in partnership with John Cat Educational, a leading publisher of books, directories, educational guides and magazines specifically aimed at forward-thinking schools in the UK and beyond. Have you checked out their latest releases? Don't miss out. Visit johncatbookshop.com to explore their full range of titles and advance your own professional development today. Happy reading. Good evening. Welcome back. I hope you all had a lovely Easter holiday. Um, So I've got an interesting one tonight. I'm going to be looking at kind of the way that um, the public respond to teachers and what we do and what they think we do and what we actually do. Um, So the DOV workload survey that was um, discussed on the Sunday show, so if you haven't listened to that, do have a listen back. Um, But one of the things that was noted on it was 69% of teaching um, thought that the teaching profession was not valued by society. Um, And I'm inclined to agree. I think people that have family members that are teachers are perhaps slightly more sympathetic to teaching and what it involved. But I generally think a lot of people don't necessarily understand what goes on and perhaps has more of a um, slightly more positive thought teaching because they were last time they remember being in schools but they were students and for them they didn't necessarily comprehend the work that went behind their lessons so um i do think it's a quite an interesting concept and why this is i don't know and i think it'd be interesting to know people's ideas as to why people think that teaching is so much easier than it actually is if, if it was so easy why are we losing so many teachers why are so many teachers off with stress why are so many teachers um hard to find and we're constantly struggling to have teachers in the profession and, and retain them so it's it's an interesting concept if it was that that amazing and that easy surely everybody would be doing it so um i'm gonna delve into it i'm quite nervous there's like some of them are quite brutal and I just don't understand quite why the, that perception, but let's give it a go. So um, here are some of these comments. So this is mainly based on an article uh, from a well-known newspaper that is about teachers striking. So um, the first comment, if it's anything like the teachers striking in my area, you'll find them in the pub I work in while ordering food and louder and louder and louder each hour there, there, there. Yep, that's going and showing everybody. I mean, I feel like when teachers are on strike, they're still, they're out in public. So therefore there's, they're going to have to go and eat somewhere. Um, so it's the most logical thing that they would go and eat. I'm sure when the t- doctors and nurses and things striked, they also went and ate somewhere during that day. Um, it just seems that perception that we're meant to be in kind of a little hole, only doing what we're meant to do. We're not allowed to be anywhere else. Um, and that should be kind of what we're, we're doing um but it is it's that's kind of i think the notions that the fact that the teachers end up in a pub every friday or or back in the olden days when teachers used to disappear to the pub for a quick one at, at lunch is is long gone um and if they were they're perhaps just using a really nice opportunity to discuss the politics of teaching together and that's probably why they were talking louder because they're probably passionate about it um somebody else commented uh they will have to take their two weeks paid holiday first um i think like the misconceptions of that is that 
the fact that we we have holidays a lot of us will work through the holidays and we work exceptionally hard the rest of of the year and it's our pay is divided up throughout the year but actually we only get paid for the weeks that we work um so it's kind of it's 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 not that perception and and i don't know a single teacher that doesn't do work during the holidays there's i know that over easter I planned lessons, I marked, I went in and did an intervention day. Granted, that was, I didn't have to, that was my own choice. Um, I'd been sick recently, so I wanted them to have that opportunity to get ready because their exam is tomorrow. Um, So I don't know a teacher that actually genuinely has the whole entire holiday off. Um, It would be nice, and I'm sure that people make the time occasionally, but I bet they're making up for it elsewhere. Um, So I think... That's that's a quite a large one that um, people don't like the idea of us having too much holiday, but they don't quite realise that we're not using it all for holiday. Um, and the idea that we can we're having these strike days and adding them on to our holiday fair, um, I think is also an interesting one. That the the I don't think the reason that we're striking is necessarily understood by the general public and I actually had this on the last strike day I ended up with some students in my room uh, because they wanted to use the computers and they were year 11 so they were all in school and they were asking me about the strikes and why I wasn't striking and I was like well I'm I'm not part of a union that that does strike it's a very small art union so it's it's not something that we generally do but I was explaining that the reason the teachers are striking is because the teacher pay is they're trying to take it out of the school budgets. And I was like, think about how many teachers there are in the school. If they increase everybody's pay by a certain amount, then that's going to be a certain amount of money. And that money is going to have to come from somewhere within the school budget. So that's going to be a teaching assistant. That's going to be equipment. That's going to be resources for you guys. And that's the reason that teachers are generally striking is that we don't want that. We, we deserve to get paid the same as everyone else and earn a bit more to cover the costs of increased living costs. But, we don't want it to come from the school budget. We don't want it to disadvantage the children. That's the the object of everything that we're passionate about. Like as teachers, we, we love students and we love teaching and we love what we do. We just want it to be resourced properly and we want to be able to afford a living and like be able to not have to scrimp and save and have issues at home. And, and I know every, everybody is having battles with the cost of living rising, but it shouldn't be that we're not getting pay rises, the equivalent to everybody else. Like the idea that, uh, England teachers on M6 could get paid is it four to six thousand less than somebody in Scotland it's it's quite bizarre but I don't think we're not turning down the money we're turning down the fact that that they want it to come from our budget and we don't want that our students to be disadvantaged anymore our, stu- our schools have had the cost of living crisis increased as well there's the cost of electricity that's massively gone on and schools have to have that power that that is the safe place for the kids to be all day <laughs> for me being at home for literally a couple of weeks with uh, my blood clots i got an email and my, my electricity bill went up by double just purely by having a couple of weeks at home all day every day and i didn't realize the effect that it has and because I'm just barely home and if I am home at weekends I'm out so I'm like I didn't realize how little I use compared to what I use during the day and the idea that schools have to fund all the schools need their lights they need the power they like there's lots of kids it needs to be fully working and functioning not to mention the computers etc um so the idea that they've had to comprehend that themselves and deal with that and that's got to they've had to scrimp and save and that's kind of come up to the budget but to then go oh actually you've got to have the salary rise come out of your budgets too it's just a disadvantage in the students and and teachers aren't striking because we're like oh we're not getting paid enough we want more money it's a the schools are struggling they are underfunded it's not fair that our children are struggling and it's and it's difficult that perhaps students and parents aren't understanding that and they're not kind of understanding where the issue is coming from and that we're actually we're striking because we want better conditions for the students so it's is it, i don't know how we get that across to parents like that's quite an interesting concept like nurses and doctors are because we're we're doing a service as well but it's it's slightly different in that respect um (laughs) so a a similar one don't they work shifts they don't work nights they don't work weekends or bank holidays they are always whining and whining (laughs) so um 
obviously we don't work shifts or night shifts, but a lot of us work way longer than people think that we work. And we don't work bank holidays, but I imagine there will be a lot of teachers working at home on those bank holidays. They will be using that bank holiday to mark or write reports or get caught up. Um, and they are always whining. I, I, I don't know. Uh, we're probably a little bit of a whiny bunch as teachers, maybe. Um, but I think it's just the pure relentlessness of teaching that kind of makes it feel like we're never done. So that's why we feel like we express that perhaps like, I think as teachers, nobody, I I don't know a single teacher that would ever complete their to-do lists. I mean, I have a to-do book because I have that much on my to-do list that I don't have enough (laughs) room on a single page that I need a whole entire book. Um, and I, like the things that I would love to do in teaching are the things that I do in, in, in the little gaps when I have spare time in my break and in my lunch or if I have that free period where I miraculously get everything that, done that's essential and I finally get a bit of time, maybe it's when your 11s have left and uh, exams, I get that little bit of time back. And that's when I can actually do the bits that I love and the bits that make a difference. But the idea that I could actually do that all the time would be amazing. I think hang on, let me get the the facts out from that survey at the weekend. Um, So 77% of secondary school teachers said they spent more time on admin than teaching. And, and I certainly I feel like I spend a lot of time. I, I don't, I don't dislike the admin. I quite like the admin side. I like understanding the admin side of teaching. And I feel like it makes me a better teacher to understand all the areas of teaching. But it's just the 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 amount of it is quite significant i don't think there's enough time um for it um i think as well like i know it's a lot like like okay strikes and more but i think if, if the strikes were also to add in to have one free ppa a day so therefore that we're given more time to plan and mark so the lessons are better on a daily basis i would i would be quite up for that as well because I just think that the the work balance isn't it's always been tough. Uh, I think I'm I'm very efficient at what I do. I don't do everything that I need to do, but I do everything that I should do, um, and I get it done very well and efficiently. And the things I do, I do to make the things where I put my effort into make time for myself later on, so I know that they're worth it. Um, so I know the hard work is kind of going to pay off at some point, but it's it's a very hard job to kind of manage all those areas. Um, I don't think people understand all the admin side that goes behind it. Like literally if a child discloses something to you and have to fill in a form, you need to make sure the correct person's got that, make sure they're getting the help that they're needed. The the, the idea that uh, if, if I don't go and hide in a staff room, and even if I do hide in a staff room, quite often kids come find me, but if I don't, I will end up having my break and lunch with kids. Like they will come to me, they will talk to me, they they want to vent about something, they've fallen out with somebody. There's all those little aspects of it. There's all the the forms, the the different online training that you have to do, all the safeguarding updates that you need to do, all the 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 little bits like that, the reports. Like for me, <laughs> I've got I've got reports due on Wednesday, so I've got sixty reports to sort out. I'm also got uh, exams for the next two days. So I've got ten hours of exams um, on top of that, and uh, talking, looking, and it's the admin side of that. So it's making sure all the examination rules are followed, making sure I've got all the candidate numbers, making sure all the portfolios are correct, make sure all the internet settings are put up correctly, making sure that I've got all the kids' different needs written out, so I know exactly what different kids need in the exams, making sure the equipment's all set up, making sure the cameras are all charged, making sure that there's no technical issues with any of the computers in the computer room for them to be doing their editing like the levels of little things to prepare I don't think are quite acknowledged I always say this I'm sure everyone's heard this on loads before but the idea that imagine how much effort you put in to do one presentation if you were to work in business or you had to present something for a job interview you'd spend quite a lot of hours for that one hour presentation you'd put a lot of effort into that Imagine doing that five times a day, back to back to back. Like it's it's highly intense. There's a lot of work and effort that goes into it. 
and and no lesson is the same every lesson is slightly different so you do have to go back and tweak and and improve it's it's not as easy as like oh i'm just going to whip out that lesson and teach it again or i'm going to take that internet lesson and 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 do that because you have to adapt it you adapt it for your children's needs i've I've just ironically after school done um, a session on adaptive teaching for our ects in our trust and and it's that idea that no class is ever the same no student is ever the same everybody is always different so you you always have to adapt every lesson there's never a cookie 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 cutter lesson that every student's the same um so you can just teach it exactly the same as you taught it the year before or that if you share groups that the the week before it's it's constant you're constantly on in that higher late high alert state um having to adapt to things that are going on in the classroom um so it is in in that respect it is quite a lot it's quite stressful and if you think about it as kind of creating five presentations a day or four if you if you're lucky to get a ppa in um so on this dv workload survey it said 86 percent said they experienced stress in their work so you can imagine that it is it is that stressful environment and i think people don't think of it as that stressful they they seem to i think in people's minds they think of that cover teacher kind of sat at the desk registering letting them get on with it or copying something out of a textbook and i think teaching has adapted a lot so the students that we're teaching now thinking about what their school was like for their parents is very different to now i think there's a lot more effort there's a lot more science behind how students learn and i think that adds to the workload because we're constantly trying to improve and and keep up with the advances and make sure our students are getting the best that they um could right let's do another one oh i've lost it um so <laughs> so next we've got uh they don't deserve to be teachers they obviously do not care for the children in their care how much more do these children have to put up with surely lockdowns were enough on their own but no, these teachers want to add even more grief to their lives. Shame on them. Um, I feel like I start putting accents on for these. Um, I I don't think anybody's a teacher for the money. It's just for the love. And, and, like, and that's, I think, one of the reasons that we do have a lot of people leave teaching is because it's not what they expected it to be. They're, you have to have grit. Like, you have to be quite determined and thick-skinned. You have to let everything like flow off your back and kind of because some days you're going to have kids screaming at you telling you to f off and nobody likes you and all this stuff but then you have to like be polite and nice to that child the next week and it, it's kind of it's not a normal situation and I don't think people understand that we put up with that we we adapt for these students we learn everything we can about their needs uh, we help them we do the best that we can, but at the end of the day, we are human and it is that very stressful environment. So I don't think any teacher doesn't have a student at the center of their hearts. And there's nobody striking because for themselves, I think everybody is striking for the students because we don't want teacher burnout. We don't want teachers to not survive teaching. We want them to love it and thrive and be better educators. We don't want the students to suffer they have suffered through covid and i think we were discussing it um the other day at school that it's not necessarily the students that we thought that had suffered we thought initially it was going to be the students that ha happened in the middle of the exam that they were going to be the difficult ones that kind of really struggled but actually we've really seen the impact on the younger ones that they've lost those social skills they're not as motivated they've lost the work ethic of not being in that school in that sessions um, and it's and it's really hard. I don't think everyone thought we were off during COVID, just not doing a lot. But I was at home setting work. Unfortunately, the person in my department handed in their notice just before COVID happened. So I was doing the work of two teachers. So I was setting work for every child in the whole entire school. I was checking their work. I was doing feedback on their work. I was uh, commenting on it. I was setting it. So I had kind of 600 odd pieces of work to mark every week as well as set the work. So the first lockdown um, in that respect was we all had to learn a lot about technology. Like my, my poor mum at 72 was still teaching and had to do live sessions on Teams because she worked in a special needs school. That was 
painful to have to try and teach her how to use online platforms. So I think in that respect, if you were a younger teacher, when all that happened, it was slightly easier. But I do think it made a lot of teachers leave the profession, having been through that. But then also a lot came back to help when there were shortages. So it is a bit um, of everything. But kind of that experience of that lockdown, I don't think any teacher didn't want to help a student that we were always there. I was always answering messages. I was getting messages from kids at three o'clock in the morning handing in work. It is, it, I think it, it's easy to say that teachers don't care, but I think actually we do. And a lot of schools dealt with things in different ways. I know my school, we all divvied up um, the students and every, t every person in the school called a different um, student to make sure that they were right and had like one-to-one -one check ins with them. Um, and like I remember one of the students that I spoke to and I think I spoke to them at like 11.30 and he was like, yeah, I've just got out of bed. Um, so like they were out of routine and it, it's really difficult if they haven't got that kind of scenario at home where they are logging in and doing the work and keeping keeping the, the, the sessions. But it wasn't anybody's fault. Teachers weren't working any less. They were adapting. But it's really hard to engage students when they're not visible um and then also we had our own families second lockdown i had to do live tutor sessions every friday um and i did my mainly with my child and my toddler sat on my shoulders um which they thoroughly enjoyed um but it, it's 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 one of those you almost had to immerse your students into your life and your life into the students and it was it showed us we were human but we were all coping it wasn't that the teachers were off having a jolly we were all surviving and I think it's unfair to say that we didn't and there was a lot of teachers that went into school and were kind of there for the key worker students we had a huge number of key worker students um, and actually those students really struggled because their parents weren't home and their parents were going into scary environments um, and it was important that we were there and we rotated that round and also made sure that our vulnerable teachers weren't in like I know that there was um a teacher locally, I believe primary school, I, I remember seeing it on the news, but I can't remember her name exactly, that um, she was going into school and caught COVID off one of the students of school. And unfortunately, I think she then got sepsis in the hospital and, and lost her limbs. Like, But teachers were putting themselves on the line. It wasn't that we all just suddenly disappeared. We were very much there for our students. Um, and we still are. And going back to school and having to teach in bubbles and rotate round and make sure they didn't interact and, and kept separate and deal with all the anxiety that the students had when they came back. I do just think people didn't necessarily understand the massive changes that happened when we came back to teaching after COVID. The, the student anxiety, the teacher anxiety, the worry. I had massive fears that... I was going to catch something and, and, and give it to my mum and she wasn't going to survive because of her age and, and other medical conditions because that's what they were telling us. People of that age weren't surviving. She caught it and gave it to me from her school. Um, but it just, <laughs> I'd rather it that way around. But it, it, it was a very scary time and we were putting our families on the line, not knowing what the consequences were going to be of that. And I, I don't think it was necessarily recognised. I don't know why there is an agenda in the in the papers and, and the news to make teachers out to be so, I don't know, self-centred, I think almost, that they kind of portray us. But I think it's quite the opposite. You don't go into teaching because you're all about you. You go into teaching because you sacrifice yourself and you give yourself to every one of those students. Um, so, yeah, I don't think we are striking to sacrifice those students and besides the majority of schools are still having like GCSE and A level students in and we're doing whatever we can to help them hence me being in an Easter home hence me doing every Monday after school because I'm like that's my child for evening I will be in school if you guys want to come hang out I will help you if you don't you don't but I will do anything for you if you come and find me at lunchtime I will give up my lunch and I will eat my lunch whilst helping you with your work because that's what I do. I don't think we're ever kind of a selfish bunch. I think we're quite the opposite. I think we're we're not necessarily capable of saying no. Uh, that's enough. I'm not going to do more than what I should. But I think as teachers, we probably need to do that more. And actually, I think that's the strikes are us saying that. Like, no, we've had enough. We're we're fed up of doing more than what we 
should be doing and sacrificing our own bodies and our own health for students that we care for because we would do anything for it but it is to the point where st staff are kind of sacrificing their own mental health and physical health for the students sake because because it's being cut everywhere else and squeezed everywhere else we're putting all these extra pressures on um right <laughs> this one's along the similar similar aspect uh, teachers got used to being fully paid for doing nothing during the pandemic they got used to it for a lot of them working for a living is the last thing they want <laughs> um yeah i definitely think that if um i would not be doing my job if i if i didn't want to work oh, i love my job i love it um but yeah i definitely didn't i missed i missed proper teaching in the pandemic and i think a lot of teachers were the same like when i when i got back to school and actually kids were in school i remember actually saying to the kids going oh i really missed you like i missed being in a classroom i missed teaching granted it didn't last long so, <laughs> um and i think again I, like when I got to teach in my classroom again I was actually in a specialist art classroom I was like oh gosh I miss this and then when I could actually not teach from the front and actually walk around and actually sit at the tables and draw and demonstrate and and talk to the kids and touch their sketchbooks and turn the pages and really have that interaction with them I was like oh I really I really really miss this I've missed old teaching granted there's lots of things that i've taken from lockdown that have improved my teaching like i love the technology like i'd never be doing this if if lockdown hadn't like progressed technology i just did an ect session with teachers from from all over the country from the isle of Wight to to birmingham so it's it's lovely that we've now got this kind of way of interacting with each other and it's created networks for teachers to kind of communicate and be with each other and support each other and access to training like i was addicted to cpd before lockdown the fact that lockdown made cpd available to me online and mainly for free i was in my element i was like i'm going to watch as much and listen to as much as humanly possible um so there's a lot that comes out of it but that, that's the bit that people don't don't see like when i tell people i'm a teacher i'm like oh yeah you love your holidays you finish at three i'm like that's not the reality that's really not like i, I don't think they quite understand the concepts even today on the teacher training day solid kind of working till three o'clock then i did the training till 4 30 got home at five now i'm doing this like i just it doesn't really finish for me i'll probably even go online and, and check check all my students portfolios before tomorrow just to have a double check one last check because i care and that's important to me and that's kind of showing my preparation and and getting ready for that i'm not gonna just abandon them but it's also one of those that i'm always at the end of my emails i don't put i take my alerts off like for my well-being i don't have my alerts on but i do check them um, but this is actually the least amount that my students have ever emailed me over the holidays before an exam. Like I've never ever had it. I had one student all all holiday and that's quite rare for me. Normally I would be getting messages most days from them. So I don't know whether that's a change from COVID that they're not, they're not as nervous or worried about exams. They're not in that exam kind of mentality um, from not having them that, that rigorous kind of testing from COVID or, or whether it's just that they feel super prepared. I'm hoping it's that one. Um, but you also have that kind of feel for them that because they've been through COVID and because they've had this disruption to their education and it's not their fault, you work harder for them. I know certainly la last year was the hardest I have ever worked for a group of year 11s because I just felt really sorry for them and it wasn't their fault. And I just gave it everything but i was i was all exhausted i was like on my knees the amount that i kind of gave to them in terms of my time and just pushing like every spare moment every spare tutor time if if kids were struggling and they had core p i'd pull them out and have one-to-ones like i would do everything i could i'd give up my free time my ppas my planning time i would do everything i could to try and and help them get across the finish line because it was those kids especially those especially those kids that turned around to me and be like 
I, I need I need a four for college and I'm not getting it this is the closest subject I can get what do I need to do um and and when kids say that I'm like I will I will go to town and I will help you get as far as you humanly can because because it's important it's their future I know that's we were actually saying at school today that quite often when you get educational um motivational speakers into school they're quite often like i did really badly in school and now i'm a millionaire um or now i'm really successful but i have flunked out of school and it doesn't matter and it's like no 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 (laughs) you're the exception not the rule um and i think it is that if you can work hard in in school and you get those opportunities you can get somewhere that you want to get to without it necessarily being harder um than it needs to be and I think that's the thing. If if you don't do well in school, life is harder. Yes, you may achieve, but it's it's going to be whether you've got the grit and determination to get there. And quite often, more than not, that those people don't. So I do think it's important that students do do as well as they can do. But we don't want them to have been affected by COVID. None of us do. None of us wanted COVID to happen. But we're all working really, really hard to get students to where they need to be. Um, and we're certainly not wanting to go da- back to pandemic part time. That's for sure. Um, what have we got? We've got another one. Um, if you don't like the pay change jobs, uh, if you don't like the pay change jobs, no doubt it's difficult for those of low intelligence to find other work. Woo-hoo. Um, I think teachers are some of the most intelligent people I've ever met. Um, would be my perception of teachers. <laughs> um, I don't think people who go into teaching are, have low intelligence. Certainly not. I think it's it's that. Oh, I don't even want to say it. That phrase. Those that can't teach. I just I just think it's a whole. You have to be intelligent to be able to do the job. To be able to think on your feet, adapt, and kind of read a room and read body language read behavior and manage 30 people in one go you you have to have something about you and you have to have some intelligence to be able to act on the spot and deal with that kind of thing um what's Lydia put if every teacher unhappy would pay less there would be no no schools true they they if everyone was just just left because actually we could all go and do other jobs of the same pay there would be nobody left and it is because you you don't do teaching for the pay you do it because you love it um i i um, have a friend that works in in coding and they were telling me how much they earn and how easy it is and how i could train up in four weeks and i could get an entry-level job on the same pay as what i'm on now and i'm like well i could train up over the summer holidays but and then i could get that job and then i could do that i could work remotely they like travel and actually i've got a friend that's um, she trained as a primary school teacher, couldn't get a primary school job near her and then trained in coding. And then, voila, she like goes and spent the summer in Spain and, and coded there part time with her son. And it's 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 tempting. When I think about that, I'm like, oh, gosh, the, 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 the level of stress that I wouldn't have if I if I got to do that would be quite nice. I can't imagine not having that stress, but also like i don't i don't think it would be the same like i really love what i do and i love making a difference and i think it just wouldn't i wouldn't get the self satisfaction if i was to leave and go and do something else um, that was a bit kind of well not generic i'm not downsizing it but that didn't have the change that it has i love the fact that i can go to work and i can go to work having like a feeling a bit pants and a kid will tell me something or say something and then I will be in fits in laughter like I I probably at least kind of once a day go well I wasn't expecting to hear that today is my general response to something <laughs> that's quite funny that shouldn't have been said um and I think that's why we do the job because although there are the lows in the workload and the stress of trying to get these children over the finish line and the pressure that there is on schools to be able to do that. But the the bits that we have when they're giggling and laughing and having a lovely time is the bits that make us fall in love with our job and make us want to do our job. Um, I had a year 10 
last year write me a Christmas card that said that um, just thank you for art. Art is her happy place. She's in a really, really dark place, but art is the light and it's the only reason she comes to school and makes school bearable. Um, and now she's quite a happy, confident child. And I just, I like the fact that I can have that impact. And I I do question sometimes, like I find I find leaving schools and changing schools quite difficult because you, you get, you spend quite a lot of time with these children. I probably spend more time with these children at school every day than I do with my own children, child um, at home in the evenings. Granted, I make up for in the school holidays, but like you get you get to know these children, you get invested. Granted, you're not going to click with every child. Every child's different. Every teacher's personality is different. But we kind of really like the students that we teach. Like we like them as humans. We like them as people. We don't see them necessarily all as complete students, and, and we want them to do well. We are their their teach like a champion, aren't we? We're, we're their champions, and we want them to do well and quite often the people that are moaning about um teachers perhaps don't necessarily have children and don't necessarily want children to do well or have didn't have a good experience of teaching and teachers at school themselves that like it's difficult for them to comprehend what teachers feel towards students like you, you nobody wants anybody to fail everybody wants everybody to be a success story um, granted there's going to be students that you clash with but we all want them to do well and we don't want them to fail and we really do give it our all to get them there per se it's not a kind of um oh we're just going to do the minimum and get them there um we really do put in the effort to make sure that every student had the have the best chance that they can um <laughs> Um, here's another one. They should go on strike over the Easter break. Um, I mean, that would defeat the object of the strike. Um, <laughs> I like the fact that the comment on that one underneath was insert lesson about how strikes work. Um, I think it is that like strikes haven't. I mean, they're very, very popular currently, but they haven't really been around for a, quite a while. Um, so is it the fact that the general public don't necessarily understand as to why people are striking? I know me personally, I'm a bit like, why are the railway strikers like striking? I don't get that. Um, so if I feel that about them, I mean, obviously, it's, I understand the doctors and stuff that is breaking down and see how the long hours that they're doing for the little pay. And again, for them, they're never going to clock off at the end of the shift and leave somebody to die. They're going to stay and make sure that they're OK before they go. They they work really long hours and they're dedicated to their jobs and their jobs have been hard and relentless with COVID. And I think it's that I don't think people necessarily understand. And again, I, I imagine that it's pretty similar in the fact that they want these budgets to be funded by the hospitals or is it outside of the hospitals? It's it's understanding kind of why um people are striking in the first place <laughs> this one's got a similar uh, thing if teachers want more money then get another job as well after all nurses have to and they work 12 hour shifts unlike teachers who finish at three and get 13 hol weeks holiday um a year um yeah i mean we know nobody works until three o'clock. I think the fact that a lot of the well-being things says to like kind of make one person, make sure you have one day where you actually leave at three o'clock because uh, we won't do it otherwise. Uh, we will, I have to sometimes for childcare reasons because my son gets a, a taxi to speech school so I have to don't have childcare after school because there's nowhere for the taxi to go other than home but the nights where I can stay I stay or if I do go home I will go home be present and then once he's in bed I will then do work um it's and same as weekends and things this is part of the reason why I decided to do my apprenticeship because I realized that for that I have to log six hours of off the job learning and I was like I'm pretty sure I do that anyway um so I might as well make it count like and I do I'm I'm well over it's really been really really interesting logging all the extra stuff that I do beyond my normal teaching hours all the extra things that I do the extra um learning that I all the educational books I read all the podcasts I listen to 
all of the uh, online training that I watch. It's it's all really, I don't think people realise they understand kind of what people put in behind the scenes to work, especially if you're getting up to those top, like the senior leadership levels, you don't just accidentally end up there unless you really invest yourself in teaching. And you're not a successful teacher with really good marks unless you invest yourself in teaching. And you know what's going on, you know what education or research is saying, and you're able to develop yourself and get yourself further. And, and that's, that's one of the things I think as well, that teachers don't have time to do that. There isn't enough time for us to do it unless you've got the willpower to do it in your own time. And I think I think it should be in like everybody's contract that you get at least one day that you can take out and, and go and do some development. I think it should be compulsory. Um, what was I what, listening to? Oh, hang on. I'm going to come off my, my stream and then I will just find this one article because I, I quite like this one. There was one um, that was um, produced. Oh, I can't remember. It's cut off the bottom. I can't see who this research is from. Uh, but it's to do with the proportion... Um, who rate the impact of CPD as high and are satisfied with their current job by hours spent on CPD in the previous years. So generally, um, you are more satisfied in your job if you've spent time on CPD in the last 12 months. Um, it, oh, this is an, a Work Life of Teachers and Leaders 2022 survey. Um, so generally, let me see whether I can do the maths. You are seven percent more likely to enjoy your job if you uh, do more hours. Um, there's some if you do between twenty one and thirty hours part time, you're you're over double uh, spent on CPG in the previous twelve months. Have enjoyed your job more, so it's it's quite interesting. I think that correlation that if you are investing in your job you enjoy your job more but it's, it's quite interesting that that's actually adding to your workload but then you enjoy your job more um i think is an interesting concept but certainly people don't realize the amount of hours that go in outside of school and that we don't finish at three o'clock um plus there's obviously all the other um extra bits like kind of the things that we do outside of school. So let's break it down. I mean, I know I'm I'm not a core subject, so I teach single one hour a week lessons, but I've got, I do share three and nine groups, but I also have three of my own groups. So that's six lots of 30 that I've got to mark. If I'm doing a marking of year nine, that's kind of quite a considerable amount of books that I've got to mark. Um, I've also got uh, four year eight groups and then I've got three year seven groups uh, no I've got four year seven groups so I've got one shared group um, so again that's another four, five, six, seven times 30 then I've got two year 10 groups and two year 11 groups which you'll also need marking and um, if you kind of add that up and put it as one minute per book it's it's quite considerable and you want to be giving them feedback more because that's going to help them improve, but it's it's not manageable with the workload that we have. I mean, a lot of schools will have like um, twice a half term marking as a general consensus, but it's literally like I was we've got six weeks and a half term, so I spend the first week kind of marking all your sevens, second week's marking your eights, third week's marking your nines, and then repeat. Um, and then obviously on top of that, I've got marked your tens and elevens, so that's quite a considerable amount. Then on top of that, you've got to mark them and then write all their reports. So at any one time, year nine reports were fun. I wrote every single one. Uh, so 560 odd reports. Um, that was not a quick process. It, my school is very efficient. It was quicker than most schools, I imagine, because they have streamlined it and tried to make it as efficient and work life balance. I generally think my school does really think about work life balance and, and workload. And it's it's probably does it better than most schools. But that's the thing. I'm at the point where I don't know where you squeeze an extra minute from. Like, where do you get any more time from? Because I'm doing it as the best of my ability. The way I mark, I mark very efficiently. 
I can do a whole class in 20 minutes um, and it will be effective and personalized. So I know that I'm effective, but I don't know how on earth I can do it better than what I'm doing it. Um, or doing the whole class feedback. But again, you still got to look at them, you still got to mark them, you still got to see them, you still got to track them. You've got to analyze your data, you've got to do your assessments. So you've got your assessment points twice a year. You've got to assess them and then you've got to mark all those assessments and then you've got to give all the kids feedbacks and uh, then you've got to write their reports and and then you get and then you get the, the emails and the comments from the parents who aren't happy with the reports because so and so you've got uh, a low grade for their homework because they didn't hand any in but that was your fault because you didn't hand it to them but um, even though every single lesson for for five weeks you've reminded them that the homeworks are there and they're also on teams if anybody wants to print them but there are additional copies in the box at the front but it's still your fault <laughs> and that's the thing I think it's it's it seems very easy in today's culture to blame teachers it's it's never the it's very much moving away from it being the student's fault and it's the teacher's fault. Um, I think there's a lot of pressure put on teachers to to make have miracles and make things happen that wouldn't necessarily um, be possible. Um, but we do our best. <laughs> we have magic ones, but they they they're not as strong as they used to be. But I think that that was we talked about that today at school. That I think. There is a, a lack of accountability that students, because of COVID, have become a little bit kind of internalised in the fact that they're in their own little bubbles. They were in this own little world that was quite mentally challenging and they are mentally exhausted and they're a bit angry at the world because of what they've had to be through and and that they blame everybody else. They have an excuse for everything rather than taking accountability because I feel like if they take accountability, they've they failed or something and I think that perhaps we need to build back in some resilience into students and and look at kind of how they can build good habits to make them improve um in terms of how they approach things because I think I don't know whether it's the fact that having gone through covid and not having that assistance to help them through things at home the ones that didn't have the help have really therefore struggled to get back into life and struggle to ask for help and struggle to admit that they're struggling and I think that's quite an interesting concept is that we've, we've now ended up with these students that are kind of quite resilient and um not resilient um unresponsive to kind of feedback because they've got they've learned this skill to block everything out that's going on like COVID was quite scary. They 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 know how to kind of stop things from affecting them. Is to to block them out. So if they're struggling, they're going to block things out. They're going to um, not participate in that, and that makes it quite difficult to kind of help them. But it is also very draining on teachers to be able to kind of help with that. Um, right, I am going to play tonight's news uh, which actually talks about um quite similar things to what i'm discussing and then we'll come back to more of these lovely comments this show is brought to you in partnership with john cat educational a leading publisher of books directories educational guides and magazines specifically aimed at forward-thinking schools in the uk and beyond have you checked out their latest releases? Don't miss out. Visit johncatbookshop.com to explore their full range of titles and advance your own professional development today. Happy reading. This is Teachers Talk Radio. And this is Teachers Talk Radio News. In union news, Daniel Kebede has been elected leader of the National Education Union. The union is the largest teachers union and has been at the forefront of industrial action over teachers pay in recent months. Mr Kebede said in a statement, after taking 69% of the vote to win the election, Secretary, I would like to thank everyone who has supported and campaigned for me. He went on to talk about the need for fundamental change in education and that this included an end to real terms pay cuts, an end to massive overwork of staff, the end of punitive Ofsteds and an increase in school funding. 
He also thanked current Joint General Secretaries Kevin Courtney and Dr Mary Bowstead for their inspiring leadership over the last six years. They will step down at the end of August. The BBC reports that, according to a leaked government document, almost a quarter of teachers in England are working 12-hour days, with around 60% of teachers saying they were doing 60 hours a week or more. The research by the Department for Education was carried out during spring 2022, but the findings have not been officially made public. Education Secretary Gillian Keegan has said that a new task force will be created to help reduce teachers' workload by an average of five hours per week. The leak comes as teaching unions consult members in England on a new pay offer, which includes the promise to reduce workload. The leaked document, marked confidential and given the title Working Lives of Teachers and Leaders, was produced by the DFE to examine issues around teacher supply, recruitment and retention. More than 11,000 teachers and leaders across primary and secondary were questioned. The report found one in four teachers were considering leaving the state sector within the next 12 months. Workload was the key factor in this decision. Three quarters said they spent too much time on paperwork. Two thirds of leaders said they spent too much time responding to government policy changes. One in five said they had low satisfaction in their working life whilst almost a half rated their anxiety levels as high. Almost three quarters of teachers described their workload as unacceptable. Dr Mary Bowstead of the NEU accused ministers of withholding important information from the peer review body, although the government denied this. A spokesperson for the government insisted that the recent pay offer of 4.3% plus a £1,000 one-off payment was fair and reasonable. The Department for Education has released an update on the .gov.uk website focusing on the review of the way relationship, sex and health education is delivered. The update comes after a number of stories across media outlets prompted concern and outrage from some quarters and claims that hysteria is being whipped up by right-wing agitators from others. RSHE education has been compulsory for pupils in primary schools since September 2020. In secondary schools, relationships and sex education must be taught. The review, which will be completed by an expert panel, will focus on how to ensure pupils have access to age-appropriate information and how to place protection from pupils being introduced to things that they are too young to understand properly. The panel will also consider how age ratings can be introduced for different parts of the curriculum. The review will be completed before the end of 2023. As we approach Easter, the debate about supporting families who receive support through free school meals should be supported in holiday times and it's opened up again. The big issue raises concerns that despite the cost of living crisis, many families will go without support until term begins again. In what it calls a postcode lottery for support, many families will miss out as current funding largely depends on where you live. In England, the government is not directly funding free school meals over the Easter break, but support may be available if local councils decide to provide meals or vouchers. Many councils are relying on the holiday activities and food programme to support low-income families. In Scotland, some councils are offering free school meals payments to low-income families, but universal free school meals for children in primary one to five will not be available. There is some support available, but it varies by council, as does the amount of support being offered. The Welsh Government has made free meals available throughout the holiday period. The Government in Wales announced that £9 million has been provided to support eligible pupils with a free meal up to the end of May half term, including all bank holidays. The support will take the form of meal vouchers, money or packed lunches. In Northern Ireland, no free school meal provision is available. The previous holiday hunger payments of £27 per fortnight ceased on April the 1st. A Department for Education spokesperson said it was because additional ring-fenced funding had ended, but campaigners focusing on food poverty said the decision was abhorrent. This has been your Teachers Talk Radio News with Joe Fox. This show is brought to you in partnership with John Cat Educational, a leading publisher of books, directories, educational guides and magazines specifically aimed at forward-thinking schools in the UK and beyond. 
Have you checked out their latest releases? Don't miss out. Visit johncatbookshop.com to explore their full range of titles and advance your own professional development today. Happy reading. I'm going to go back to that last tweet because I just had a thought. So um, it was saying about how teachers should have second jobs um, like nurses do after their 12 hour shifts. Um, but obviously, if you haven't listened to it, I've got uh, I've done a previous show on the side hustles that I have um, and the things that me and other teachers I know do. And I know a lot of teachers uh, tutor on the side and do online tutoring or in-person tutoring. I tutor a university student. Um, I've rented my house out for a film. My friend has used her family t- as a model on a model sh- family shoot, like in the holidays, and they got a free holiday with it. So I do think like teachers do do a lot of things on the side to help supplement the income. I think it's got to that point where kind of we have to. Um, so that was an interesting one. Um, so here's the next one. I'd sack the lot anyway. Uh, with all the rubbish stuff they are teaching kids nowadays. Um, so I don't I don't think what we're teaching kids is rubbish. I feel that um, curriculums have developed significantly since back in the day um, and that it is far more relevant and interesting and diverse than what it used to be. Granted, I, th- I think as teachers, we're, we're never going to be happy. We're always going to want to develop things and change things. And also as things happen in the world, we're always going to want to change them and make things different and improve them and make them relevant and current. And I think that's why we do our job. We, we want to teach the kids the best we can teach, the most information we can teach them and equip them to go into the world ready and as whole rounded humans like that's what we want we want them to give them the best trampoline push off to succeed in life as possible and I think that's through ambitious curriculums um that show autonomy that you know your students you know your area know what's available and what's relevant and I think as teachers we we do a lot of that I think teaching isn't I think that's the problem teaching isn't what it used to be like I don't think teachers people that aren't in education don't understand how much teaching has changed like thinking about when I was at school I was taught on blackboards and overhead projectors which granted I have one of those in my room because I print on copy of film and then I put the pictures on the copy of film to enlarge onto canvases for the for when the kids need to um, scale up their drawings. But literally when I roll out that bad boy, they're like, what is that? I'm like, this is how I learn. I was like, they didn't have these electric whiteboards in my day. I was like, this is how we taught. The teacher wrote in whiteboard pen on these plastic sheets and then put it on here, projected onto the board and we copied it down. Like that was how I learned. There was none of this available to us now. I mean, on my previous show when we were talking about secondary science, I was saying about how I was taught biology by the fact there was a pig with one head and two bodies in a jar on the shelf. Like, I'm I'm really making myself sound really old, aren't I? Um, But teaching has drastically improved. And I think that has come with the idea of technology. We have access to all of the world now. We know what is happening all around the world. We know what is happening technologically around the world. We're able to have instant news reports from things that are happening everywhere, whether that be like kind of in people's lives or whether it be an earthquake or or a business idea or the way something is made. Like we have all this access to things that we didn't used to have. And I think that makes education way more interesting. I think it also makes it like way vaster and it's really difficult to teach everything that we need to teach in the, in the time frame that we do have. Um, and I think that's quite difficult. I do wonder whether uh, I've always wondered whether actually we need kind of an extra subject or whether we change kind of maths or just change the subject slightly. So whether there's a, a an advanced maths at GCSE and an everyday maths where we teach them about mortgages and credit card interest and and all of how to budget and all those things and the life skills, how tax is generated and actually teach them those things. And same as like like our catering lady is amazing, but do we actually need to have more on on 
the nutritional content how to eat to have a healthy body like same as a sport when i was talking to josh on a previous show we were talking about the wide range of sports that's available and that people have a negative connotation with sport because they think of sport as as rounders as a kid and how traumatic that was as opposed to like weights or uh, rowing or or like finding the sport that you click with that sometimes kind of being taught things that you're not interested in gives you a negative content of, of that subject or that area and that actually teaching the whole point of teaching is that it is wide it is vast so you find your place and actually we were talking about this in terms of our, our what's good about our school today was that that there is it's a, it, we have a broad curriculum that means students find their place they find the area of education that they like and enjoy and are happy in and can thrive in we don't limit them we don't force them into anything they don't want to do um I mean, granted, there's always that kid that doesn't want to do anything, but we try as best as we can to get up to know our students, understand our students and find somewhere that they can achieve and thrive. And, and that's going to make, help them do better. And I think, especially as an art teacher, there's a lot of negativity in that respect to art, like arts are useless profession. Like you can never, you're never going to make a living of that, give up that early. Like, but actually, if you like ask any artist, anybody that's out there working as an artist, all oh, they're happy people. They might not have all the money in the world, but they love what they do and they are in a happy place. And I think that's more of a message to get across to students. Find something that you can love so you can get a job in something that you love. So it's not hard work, that you enjoy it because that you're going to be in your job more than anything else in your life. So you better find something that you actually enjoy and that you can do well in. You don't want to be doing a job that you find mundane or uninteresting. Like we want our kids to find something they can love and, and thrive in and I, I think that's probably why I've accidentally ended up back into teaching like um, I rebelled against the family uh, family uh, jobs but I love it I just I really do love what I do and I love helping kids find that area that safe place that they can f just be themselves and relax and and some of them will kind of like really open up and kind of let you know what else is going on and, and why that is their place. And I think that's what's special about schools that I think as an adult looking back at school, you don't necessarily, you forget the things that kind of were the little things that made the difference. Right. <laughs> what have we got now? We're not all getting sacked. Um, shame on them. Children have been through enough or oh, similar. You know what the wages were when you became teachers, uh, though we could, would be handy if they strike for a whole week so parents could take their children away at a cheaper time. <laughs> I see their logic. I mean, I'm not, I, I'm not, I'm not averse to that. Like I hate the fact that cause I'm paid so much. I haven't been abroad in seven, no, uh, no, nine, nine years. It's been nine years since I've gone on holiday because and I'd started teaching 11 years ago. So basically I became a teacher and then realized that holidays are far too expensive in the holidays and I no longer go on them. Um, so, I mean, fair play to the people that get in there early and get plan it well ahead and get budgeted. Or um, And I actually think the first holiday I did go on when I was a teacher, I went a very bizarre way. I went, I was trying to get back to Bali because I used to live there. And so I went, I went to Kuala Lumpur and then Doha and then Singapore and then but I think it took me like over 30 hours to get there um because that was the cheapest human possible way of getting there but I was young then so I didn't mind the travel um but yeah you, d you definitely don't get into teaching for the holidays abroad we get lots of lovely long holidays to recuperate but they're not jet setting holidays where we spend all that time abroad that's for sure um but yeah I'm, I'm, I, we feel that pain. It's at least you, like, once your kids are growing up, you can go on nice holidays or, um, we're always stuck in the expensive holidays. I do like it. Like whenever somebody said to me, if you don't know when the school holidays are, just check the centre parks website because it goes up by double. Um, but it is, that, it, that is a tough bit. Like you can't afford to go in on holiday because it is so expensive. Um, 
and that's the thing i don't think i don't think people realize that about teaching as well is that you can't take days off like you can't just be like oh i'm going to take a monday off and go away for a long weekend oh i'm gonna i need a week off here or i'm gonna take a day off there like you have to do all your adulting in the holidays and that is tough like i think that was a couple of people that i spoke to today i was like what do you do i was like oh i did i did I did like life problems. Like I, I sorted the garden and I, and I did this. I, I went to the post office. I sorted out my banking and it's like, you can't do that because you, you can't get to those places in work teaching hours. Like you can't have a day off, like, or if you've got a wedding or what have you, and it's on a Friday, unless you've got an exceptionally nice head that will allow you to take it unpaid, then you're not likely to go out to that like you are going to miss things that normal people get to do that you can't, you you just literally can't take a day off. And I think that's a bit um, perhaps missed with the fact that everyone's into the long holidays otherwise. Um, right, what have we got next? They've basically been on strike for three years due to their instance of not teaching during COVID. For once, can they think of the children? Um obviously um yeah we've not been on strike for three years i i've i've been teaching for 11 12 years i've lost count um the last three years have been the hardest of my teaching career certainly not the easiest certainly not reduced hours that's for sure um what have we got next? Oh, hang on. So there's a couple of other comments. Right. Um, this is generally teachers um, sitting back that people don't really have an idea of what teaching like and what it's like in its current state of affairs. Um, so it is quite interesting in that respect. I think, why is it that people don't understand? Why is there this kind of disconnect? It's quite interesting that people just don't understand kind of education and then there's the idea that Richie Sunak is going to do maths till 18 like where are you going to find the teachers for that where are you going to find the funding where are you going to find the hours um let alone the, the idea that children are actually going to want to do it it's it's a nice idea but I don't think people have any idea of how bad teaching is and the same as like what was it in that news article that um the education secretary was talking about giving us five hours per week um, of reduced teaching hours. We all know that that's going on cover, don't we? Like if they're reducing our, our teaching hours, they are going to be using that on cover. You're not getting that teaching hours. I mean, my school's pretty good in that respect and doesn't really use teachers for cover, but like, where does that come from? Where does the people come? Where does the extra, that's an extra teacher, isn't it? So where do they, well, more than an extra teacher if everybody in the school gets that, where are those extra teachers coming from to cover that? Like, it just doesn't, it's not, it's not feasible. Like there's no logic behind, if you were to give every teacher five hours per week, extra reduced to reduce the workload, like she's saying, like that's going to cost more funding than actually paying the teachers, surely. Like, I don't, I don't know where the teachers are going to come from. They're going to fill those. They're going to teach those lessons because the kids are still going to be in school. It's not going to be like, oh, we're going to give you five extra hours a day. So we're going to, everyone's going to finish at two. Is that okay? <laughs> like that is not going to go down well. The kids are still going to be there. So what, what, who's looking after them? Who's teaching them? So it's, it's an interesting one, isn't it? And certainly with that comment as well about on average, uh, teachers reckon that they teach 12 hours a day with 60% of teachers teaching 60 hours or more. So, I mean, it's it's a lot of hours that are unaccounted for in terms of the public perception. Um, we do teach far more than what people think that we do. Um, and I know that I, and I, I don't think people realise, like, when I was pregnant, I was, I remember very vividly, I was working till six, seven o'clock at night, every night at school. I remember my deputy would come and find me and kick me out at about kind of half six, seven o'clock and be like, you need to go home now. Like I was very much working to make sure everything was set up and done for when I was away. So the kids weren't let down. Like I, I probably shouldn't have 
been working to that extent but I felt fine in my pregnancy and I wanted to do what was best for the children they were more important than my own health and like I think that's the thing with teachers is we do put the kids before ourselves and that's really difficult and same as like I I worked up to my due date I was I was due on the 4th of January and again we we were talking about this today because one of the other teachers um daughter is a teacher and she's pregnant and she was like, if I don't go in on the first day back, if I don't go in on the inset day, then my maternity gets pay, uh, taken from the two weeks before the Easter holidays. Now, that wouldn't happen on any other job. You would say my maternity date is this and it would start from that date. It's not like if that maternity date starts in the Easter holidays and it's you're losing that time. And that was like for me. I was like, if I didn't go in on inset on my due date, I my maternity would have been made to start two weeks the week two weeks before before Christmas and I was like I can't afford to lose that money like that's two weeks like where I would have worked but because it's the school holidays I went so I went in on my my inset day granted at lunchtime they went we don't want you to give birth please can you go home um I I always knew in my head that I was going to be late so I was going to be fine the only thing was like they gave me a box of celebrations and I got home and I dropped them on the floor and was absolutely devastated because I couldn't reach them um (laughs) it is that like in reality, like if that was another job, I would have never have done. I've never worked those hours. I would have never gone in on my due date to to make sure that I got paid for the previous two weeks. So that, like there's a lot of things that people don't look at in that respect. And and it isn't, especially like people like, oh, it's great. You 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 teach that works perfectly with childcare. And it doesn't. Like obviously I've got all the inset days that I've got to get behind childcare. Like my school st- <laughs> starts before my son's school but I don't have enough time to get to my school and it finishes there's 15 minute gap between my school and his school finishing and I have a 20 minute journey so I'm not getting there in time so I have to pay for breakfast club I have to after school club like I am like when I was ill I got to pick my child up on a Friday and I was like I'm a year he's a year and a half into school and I've never ever picked him up from school not once not once and he'd like asked me quite a lot he's like please will you pick me up from school I'm like mummy has got to teach other kids like I, I don't have that novelty I know some schools are really lovely and they allow you if you if they can for you to go and watch nativities or go to first days at school um and stuff like that but we generally like that's not a regular thing and it's not something that schools can do for all stuff so there's a lot of things that we miss out on like I I didn't go to my son's sports day I haven't didn't go to his Christmas concert I didn't like there's lots of things that we can't do because they're in school hours and we have other responsibilities. We don't get to go, Oh, I need to have this personal day or I need to do that. And I think, I think that's something that could be brought in in education. The idea that actually every teacher gets one day a year that they can put in wherever they want, that they can have cover and they can have a day off. I think that would do lots for people's work life. Cause I feel like sometimes you do feel, very stuck that you can't do things you can only do things in the holidays where everything is really busy and you're bound to bump into students and you don't actually really that that high alert of like oh sun's low i'm gonna be sunbathing on the beach and this is when i'm gonna jump bump into students and it always is um but it is that just having that time to perhaps do things for yourself personally during a day when things are open and it not be the holidays when you've got your own kids and you've got to try and do things it, it is it is I think perhaps more difficult to balance than people um, perhaps perceive. Um, Right, let's see whether we can find any more ones. Um, Teachers, public sector workers and indeed other workers are quitting their jobs and finding other better paid jobs for more money. There is no loyalty to employers these days. It's time legislation was introduced that an employer can veto and block any staff member leaving why spend time and money training ungrateful workers when they can leave on a whim and the employer gets no compensation oh i feel that one that one's painful um i mean they don't get it do they you have to give half a term's notice again you don't have that in any other job what other job do you get a job but then have to work another like six to eight weeks. Or if you're you're in senior leadership, you're a term, sometimes a term and a half, sometimes two terms. Like it's insane that we we can't leave 
like on a whim like if you if you're mentally struggling in a school the amount of times we've seen that the amount of times i've seen it on twitter where people are like anonymously going i am struggling i can't cope with my school it's toxic i really want to leave but i can't find another job or there's no jobs in my area to swap to and you're kind of like stuck or even if like the idea of if you do get a job you've still got another like five six weeks potentially more depending on when you get that job like potentially majority of them come up at the beginning of terms you're talking like six eight nine weeks before you actually leave and that's quite painful that you're in a job that you don't want to be in potentially getting spoken to by other members of staff or or kind of dismissed for leaving it's it's quite I don't, that's the thing that essentially that already happens. That person saying that there should be a clause that, that actually you can't leave that that already kind of exists. You can't really leave properly without giving your half a term, at least a half a term's notice. So, and if you do do a half term's notice, then you're really frowned on. Cause if you're handing in half term's notice, you're like right on the last day, aren't you? So you're screwing over your school by doing that. So essentially it's way more than that and I don't think people necessarily realize that either like if you do want to leave you can't <laughs> yeah um leader to put like now if I got a job elsewhere at another school I'm not going I'm not I'm not leaving until September <laughs> like we're in April like that's insane no other job no other job would you be stuck doing it and and have to prep leaving and and look for jobs in such a like a short window so far in advance um it's it's just really interesting isn't it people's perception of what teaching is versus what it actually is and and same as like that idea of once people train uh, they shouldn't be allowed to leave i think it's the fact that um people are training and they don't know what teaching's like and that's why they're leaving it's not the fact that they're they're getting trained up and and going oh i love the money um but actually this isn't for me it's they're like oh this is far too much work for for the money i'm out like to give up all of that time and to be honest most teacher trainings are done kind of on their own like uh, you a lot of them don't have bursaries so essentially you're having a year without being paid to get qualified and then you've you've given up everything and, and got this position and gone through all that and then you're realizing that whoa this is far more work than I expected and I think that's why people are leaving and also I think the fact that schools are struggling in terms of funding and and staffing and and also generally like sickness is up generally so there's a lot of cover and a lot of mental health illness and mental health and sickness that it just makes schools are tough and it puts a lot of pressure on trainees and there is a lot for trainees to do it is one of up there with some of the hardest years in terms of teaching in terms of workload so I think if you can master it then um then you can make it but there's no point of denying that and making it cushy and all lovely and make people fall in love with teaching for them to then realize that it's actually really difficult um I don't know what the answer is. There's potentially a thing, I guess, of like if you have a bursary and then you don't stay in teaching, then maybe you need to pay that bursary back, kind of a bit like a university degree that you have to have done X amount of years and it goes down every number every year that you work to make people pay it back. But then why would you want people to stay in a job that they're miserable in? It's definitely it takes a specific person to be a teacher and you have to have a hard skin with it with these comments. All right, let's see if I can find another one. Um, um, let's see, these are quite similar ones. We'll try and, um, <laughs> okay. Um, oh, I don't even know whether I want to read this one, but one good thing if they are out on strike, they're not there to aid and abet the manipulation of vulnerable children with gabble gob agenda lessons or oh, I feel that like kind of links in with the news a bit about the PSHE lessons and being like age appropriate I think that also says a bit about kind of the people in that are in society that don't necessarily uh, think as forward thinking and teaching I think if, if you're a teacher you do have to be very open you have to understand what's going on in 
in the world in in young people's lives and how the world is adapting and changing and what society is and and give children a safe place to be whoever they want to be we're not misguiding them we're educating them because a lot of them are not getting the right information and not got the right places to go to and 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 that just proves it with his language that he doesn't really understand what schools are offering it's it's a safe place for students to be who they want to be and find out who they are and what they are and what they want to be um so yeah <laughs> um oh this one reckons that the the uh, the government should ignore the results of this so-called vote there has clearly been a huge ballot rigging by the unions um because yeah that's all they've got time for um There's a lot of people going, uh, oh, it's... the response from teachers is quite interesting. Generally, a lot of people are going, I'm sick and tired of you do it if it's so easy. Tell you what, when a teacher works 12 hour night shifts on Christmas Eve and then another on Christmas Day, as I did last year, then I'll give it a go. I'll be part, it'll be part time easy for me. So, like, obviously, that's um, a nurse. I think everybody's got their own different areas i don't think until anybody is it's one of those things isn't it until you've walked in my shoes you don't know what it's like um but yeah i think a lot of people trying to explain that it doesn't come out of it's it's not coming from the government it's coming from the school it's coming out of the school um <laughs> to teach or not to teach if you're pondering that dilemma the answer is not um the government gave 10 percent to the work shy um why not teachers um when i was like somebody's replied the government have given themselves a bit more than that that's very true um and it's just like it is that kind of idea isn't it that they're not understanding that it's not coming from it's coming from the school budget. It's not that we want more money. Obviously, we want it to be relative. We want to be able to afford to put afford our mortgages and afford our food and put money on um, food on the table and live a normal life. We don't want to have to leave teaching to find money elsewhere. Um, but we don't want. Most importantly, is the main reason that we're striking is that we schools need to change. Like there is no kind of extra budgeting for the heating there's no and now they want us to do the pay rises out of the budget it just doesn't work it doesn't happen kind of that way um without having a massive effect on the students and at the end of the day that should um really be what, what's important <laughs> let's strike and sack the lot of them they don't teach anything um <laughs> worthwhile and the kids don't learn anyway no loss to either uh it's, it's interesting isn't it it's like either sack them and get rid of them all so therefore like because we're not doing a good enough job teaching or it's the other side it's like oh they're striking and letting the kids down again like it it, it is the two extremes like you can't kind of there's, it's it's bizarre isn't it how they're one or the other um uh yes let's let's have a nice extended bank holiday weekend off and no we won't take the friday the 20th off because that might be reserved for a teacher training day uh be careful you might interrupt the holidays um Sack all the headmasters and bring in some private sector directors and managers to run the schools with the support of education PAs would still be cheaper. Crikey. I just think people just don't understand what's involved. Three months holiday a year, nice pensions, a liberal sick leave. The teachers union should be ashamed of their continuing agitation. It's just... Every day a child's education is vital, we're told, and we are fined for taking our kids out of school. Every teacher who strikes should be fined the same as we are. But for every child in their class, in fact, they should be fined a lot more so parents can cover the days off. 
or the extra childcare. Now, I completely appreciate that. As a, as a parent, I understand that like having to take that time off work because of the strikes is difficult. But it's it's we're not striking because we don't care about the students. We're doing it for the kind of moving education f- forward. It's we want it to be right and we, we're trying to make a difference. We got to the point where we can't just sit and keep going as we are because education system's gonna break down. Like it's on its knees. It can't go keep going as it is or it is gonna it's gonna have a massive crash at some point. Um what's Lydia put? If the job is so cushy, why is there a shortage? It is so easy with so much holiday, then why isn't everyone trying to do it? It's exactly that. If it's so easy, there should be way more people applying, doing their teacher training, wanting to do it. Um, and at the DOV workload survey said one in four said they were considering leaving state education in the next 12 months. Can you imagine even if, if another 25% of teachers leave, there's not going to be enough teachers left. It is going to be really difficult to continue education in the way that it's going if there aren't any teachers left. And there aren't any. Like, if, if all that's left are the good teachers, if we're not, if the ones that are really passionate that keep going, that kind of drive past themselves, that they work to a point where they're making themselves sick, then we're going to lose those as well. And it and it is, it, education isn't going to be as good as it can be. Like education should be this beautiful thing where students have a safe place to learn, grow, make mistakes, find out who they are and become these great people to go into society and make the world a better place. But if we're on our knees and we're exhausted, it's it's going to be really hard to give the students what they deserve. And also what we deserve. If you have happy teachers that are fulfilled, that feel rejuvenated and energetic and enthusiastic and have time to create resources and aren't spending their spare time doing second jobs or working in the holidays, um, it it is going to provide a better education and a better thing. Like the public should be supportive of teachers teachers aren't the type of people to lie they've got very good moral compasses so you're not going to lie and say that um teaching's awful purely because you want more money we're striking and saying that teaching is on its knees because it genuinely is like and that it can't continue it as it is and that we want to make a change for the positive for the future and i think there obviously is an issue as well with the fact that we haven't had an educational secretary who's actually been a teacher. So like we need somebody in education to be at the top. So, and not somebody that's been kind of shot through um, political parties, that somebody who has actually worked long, hard hours as a teacher in a range of schools that has brought schools up from the bottom that genuinely know what it takes and that we create this community of education that supports each other not judges and tears them apart when schools are struggling that we create something and share something across education that can flourish and build and because teaching is amazing and I truly love it and I wouldn't want to be doing anything else in the world but there are points where you think it, it you can't continue like this and and that's the thing if you're in a job where you think oh I'm I'm I've given all that I can give and I can't put myself back together it's not feasible and I think that's that's I think honestly the holidays are the reason that teachers survive I know that everyone's like oh you have far too long a holidays you have all these long holidays I genuinely think if the the holidays were halved that the teachers would break that they need that time to recharge rebuild themselves re-energize themselves and then plan and get ahead and do the things that they need to do because we are working in the holidays whether people believe it or not and then you can go back in refreshed and go again and do give the students the best. If you 
if you lose that, then I do think that people are going to crash and way earlier um, in teaching. And I think that's the bit people don't see. People don't see teachers kind of, they see te- they generally see teachers in their holidays, don't they? When teachers are out and about, all happy and chirpy because they've, they've had their holidays. They don't see them in the thick of it when they're, they've been working, leave school at kind of uh, nine o'clock at night. Because let's face it, parents evenings, you can be in at half at eight o'clock and you're not leaving till like nine o'clock at night. And then you've got to get up and go again the next day. Like there are, and that is constant talking. Obviously, I'm quite good at that. Um, but it is an exhausting job, but we do it because we love it. And we do it because we want our students to do the best thing. And actually, if the public got behind us and understood what we were fighting for, then their children would get a better education. And that's the bit that I'm not quite sure how we fix. How do we get the public on side? How do we get them to understand that we know what we're talking about? We love what we do, but we're doing it because we want these students to succeed. You've been listening to Teachers Talk Radio. Tune in live and listen back at ttradio.org. We look forward to hearing from you next time on Teachers Talk Radio. This show is brought to you in partnership with John Cat Educational, a leading publisher of books, directories, educational guides and magazines specifically aimed at forward-thinking schools in the UK and beyond. Have you checked out their latest releases? Don't miss out. Visit johncatbookshop.com to explore their full range of titles and advance your own professional development today. Happy reading.